Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Hello and welcome. I'm Nozi Pumbanjo and this is Invest Africa. Now, as a consumer, it is the ultimate grudge purchase. But when disaster strikes, it's usually the only safety net. That's right, we're talking insurance tonight. Now, only a mere 3.5% of the African population is insured, leaving a vast untapped market. As industries and middle income earners grow and regulatory environments change, the market conditions for insurance penetration on the continent look increasingly favorable but before we delve into that let's take a quick look at the global insurance industry and how Africa fits into this broader picture looking at real premium growth rates in 2013 with the darker shades in this uh, geographic representation representing a deeper penetration of insurance with the exception of South Africa and Kenya in Africa we're seeing that this is a relatively untapped continent when it comes to insurance penetration interestingly though that if we do compare this with other emerging markets, we're talking Latin America and the parts of Asia, they have far superseded the African continent in terms of penetration. It certainly raises questions as to what these markets have done differently that has left Africa behind. Let's turn our focus now to insurance growth by region. These are statistics uh, reflecting uh, dynamism from 2013. Three figures that I want to draw your attention to. The world average, uh, the emerging markets average, and of course uh, the advanced market average. And what we see here is that emerging markets have far outstripped not only the world average, but as well as advanced markets in terms of insurance growth by region. Where does Africa fit into this picture? We bring Africa into the picture. It lags behind other emerging markets, but still performing way above advanced markets and the world. So there is some hope in terms of uh, improving the conditions that allow for growth of this particular sector on the continent. Let's turn our focus now to the growth of real premiums. Again, looking at uh, figures from 1980 so we're having a 35 year window here with the dark blue blocks uh, representing total premium growth this is around the world um, the, the dark orange representing emerging markets and the navy blue representing the advanced uh, markets and again what we see here is that emerging markets have performed far above the uh, the advanced markets. Now, turning our focus to a 10-year average, uh, which starts here, the dark green line again bring emerging markets and the lighter green line being advanced markets. Again, a vast difference in terms of real premium growth. An interesting point on this graph to turn our focus to is this uh, 2008 mark here where we saw premium growth uh, in the world and advanced economies in particular dipping into the negative and yet the resilience of the insurance sector is shown there in uh, emerging markets still growing far above the world average. So that's what the global picture looks like in terms of the penetration of the industry but as well as, well as uh, the penetration or growth of real premiums. But to join me now to give me more insight on Africa's insurance industry is Langa Madonko. He's an analyst at African Strategic Impact Advisors. And in our Lagos studios, we're joined by Yomi Onefade. He is Retail Divisional Director at Mansard Insurance. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Let's start off in Nigeria. Yomi, just give us a sense uh, and paint us a picture of the insurance industry in Nigeria. What are the key uh, investment opportunities here and what are the challenges that perhaps hold Nigeria back from even greater investment? Nigeria presents a fairly um, unique uh, environment, so to speak. Yes, over the last couple of years, we've seen uh, a, an improvement in uh, the entire insurance market with a couple of companies such as ourselves paying a lot more attention to the retail market space. Um, traditionally, what we've seen is a market that has largely been uh, broker dominated, which has meant that um, of all the uh, distribution platforms open to pushing insurance products, you have uh, essentially almost about 90% of the market being um, all, with broker-dominated markets, uh, only about nine, one out of a multiple number of distribution outlets had been uh, properly utilized, which meant um, areas such as uh, agency, uh, retail distribution, corporate agency distribution, um, distribution through 
uh, partner such as banks and other um, like institutions have largely been uh, underutilized. Uh, in fact, the truth is there, there isn't proper regulatory framework for mm -hmm. quite a number of these other areas. So from the Nigerian perspective, the one positive is the fact that we're coming from such a low level that um, the only way to go is up. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, let's also try and remember the fact that there are certain areas of um, insurance that is captured in other markets that are not captured as part of insurance data within Nigeria. So, for example, if you look at the health industry, um, health insurance, which will have been captured within other markets, is not um, factored into uh, insurance calculation. What is calculated within uh, insurance premiums here, it's to, um, right now, is what you'll call yep. uh, the P&C, the property and casualty as well as the life and savings. Even pensions, which has, uh, was removed from the industry back in 2004, uh, when the Pension Reform Act came into being, is not factored into insurance premium uh, calculation mm -hmm. here. But we're beginning to see uh, a bit of the pensions come back in form of annuities. Mm -hmm. And what has been done in the pension goes a long way to show the potential in terms of um, what can be achieved within the core uh, property and casualty and the life and saving side within the insurance uh, industry here. Yomi, I think you've done a fantastic job of just giving us a great snapshot of the industry dynamics uh, in Nigeria. Let's uh, take the same question, bring it back to Johannesburg in South Africa, one of the markets with greater penetration. Langa, let's bring you into the conversation. Give us an idea of uh, the key dynamics in the South African insurance uh, sector, just the positioning that against what we hear from Nigeria. Okay, um, I think one of the things that we need to take into account is that South Africa is very far advanced in terms of uh, insurance uh, compared to the rest of the continent. Uh, South African dynamics, you have very established players like your Sun Lambs, like your Liberties, who have been in the space for quite a while and they continue to experience growth. But you have to also juxtapose that um, against a place like Nigeria, they will not necessarily experience the same, the same type of growth because the dynamics of our economy are such that uh, they can't do that because we are at a significantly higher pace. Um, I think also we need to take into account that um, we are taking advantage of more of the distribution channels that are available to us. Mm. Uh, like Yomi said, we here have an, a, f a very good regulatory system and we are able therefore to use banking as channels for the distribution. But in contrast, you get uh, places like Nigeria. They have a lower base, so therefore the potential for growth is going yeah. to be higher. And they have started the process of regulatory reform towards uh, bringing in, li in line with global uh, patterns their insurance mm. industry. Uh I, I want to latch on to that last point that you make and bring it back to you, Yomi, in particular, the regulatory reforms. Are they keeping uh, the pace that is required from the investment community? You're looking at Nigeria and saying this has, is a great investment uh, opportunity in terms of the low penetration levels. Is the regulatory environment uh, keeping up and ensuring that it, it is supportive for investors to get in? First and foremost, uh, let's recognize the amount of work that um, the regulators have done over the last couple of years. Um, you can't overnight fix uh, decades of, um, of problems. That's, that, that should be made quite clear. Uh, so the regulator has gone about picking uh, specific battles and uh, so in terms of even stripping out, in, uh, ensuring that there's greater uh, financial discipline, uh, financial accounting, uh, standardization of accounting across uh, insurance industries. 10 years ago, you couldn't pick um, the financials of 10 insurance companies and be able to uh, compare them side by side. Each one had a different look and feel. But with IFRS and a couple of other um, internal um, regulations, uh, the regulators have been able to largely clean up mm. that side of the business, even to areas to do with implementation of um, 
issues around receipts of premiums. Mm. Yomi, I want to get in because I want to get your perspective of whether you think the regulators have prioritized the right things to move the industry forward at an accelerated pace. My personal opinion is that, yes, maybe there are a few more things that um, could have been you know, focused on, especially in terms of distribution. Um, opening up more, you know, creating the uh, regulatory framework to open up more distribution uh, channels. And uh, I think that also has to do with the ability to coordinate with other regulatory mm. agencies. So um, how well can we um, work with other regulators? Yeah. Have they been able to work with other regulators such as NCC, such as CBN, um, and the like to come up with um, programs that yeah. uh, can be more encompassing to create um, that enabling environment for investors to be able to put in um, uh, to be able to put in investment into the insurance companies or yomi. into into ancillary distribution outlets. Right. So clearly, so yes, yomi, a, a I'm going, I'm going to uh, just jump in there because I want to quickly bring it back to Johannesburg before we take a break. But no doubt, uh, the distribution channel uh, is obviously very, very important for insurance and a key focus for regulators. Langa, let's come back to South Africa, where you've described it as a fairly advanced industry with established players. What about new players wanting to get uh, into onto the playground? Are the entry barriers uh, enabling new players to come into, into play? I think uh, entry into the market is going to become a whole lot more difficult because, uh, like I said, the market is a whole lot more mature. You will start to notice that your bigger players, your sun lambs, your old mutuals, uh, everybody's starting to say, what's our play? in the Africa space. Mm. So for someone who's coming into the South African market as a new entrant, you definitely have to be in the mold of a discovery, highly innovative. You have to either also then possibly be a niche player like uh, outsurance, which leads in particular segments of insurance, particularly motor insurance if you are in outsurance. Mm. So I think um, there is an opportunity, but the ease of accessing the opportunity is going to be quite difficult, mostly because of where the other big players are positioned, but also because there is a sentiment uh, generally that uh, South Africa might be one of the more over-regulated uh, com countries yeah. in terms of uh, well, the financial services space inclusive mm. of insurance. So it certainly sounds like uh, there isn't enough room to play in South Africa, but Africa is open for business. We're going to pick up on that point and much, much more when we come back from this very short break. Welcome back to Invest Africa. Tonight we're talking about the insurance market in Africa. Remember that you can be a part of these conversations. You can tweet us at CNBC Africa and the hashtag is Invest Africa. Still with me, my guest, Langa Madongo. He's an analyst at African Strategic Impact Advisors. And in Lagos, uh, we're joined by Yomi Onifari. He's a retail divisional director at Mansard Insurance. Now, before the break, I said that we'd take the conversation to Africa. Let's start off with another market that has enjoyed a high penetration or relatively high penetration of insurance uh, with, compared to the rest of Africa. Langa, let's talk East Africa for a moment and Kenya in particular. What is it that the, the Kenyan market has gotten right from a regulatory perspective that enabled them to enjoy such high levels of penetration? Um, I think Kenya has benefited from uh, innovations that came before, for example, Safaricom and your Impesas. So as the, um, they had to regulate how that worked and the movement of money around that whole mm. um, system. So what has then happened is that now as insurance companies have come online, the mobile money transfer, mobile payment systems in Kenya are, re are fairly well regulated and fairly advanced. So most of the insurance companies that have come on have found ways to get uh, the people who are signing up to pay 
through those uh, mobile payment platforms. Mm -hmm. And that has really helped to accelerate uh, the growth of the insurance space, in particular in that country. And I think um, the other thing that is coming online that is going to be of significant benefit is the integration of the East Africa community yes. and them having a similar financial regulatory system. That has allowed a lot of Kenyan insurance uh, businesses that are established or growing to then expand their footprint, taking advantage uh, of that common uh, trade mm. union and they are starting to do business in Burundi, mm -hmm. Rwanda, Uganda and the infrastructure that they are finding there is fairly the same yeah. in terms of regulation. So almost a hub and spoke approach by the, the players saying if we put a, 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 you know, a, a central place in one of the markets we have uh, the ability to expand into the other markets. Let's go to Nigeria. Uh, Yomi, there's two important points that Langa raises and it would be really interesting to see uh, what the Nigerian experience is of the two. The first is, is innovation where we're seeing a convergence of insurance and telecommunications. To what extent is that movement taking off in Nigeria and really pushing insurance penetration and also Yomi if you can uh, comment on uh, the regional integration uh, that uh, we've seen you know East Africa really being ahead in this regard but West Africa is not that far off either. If I'll take the uh, integration in Africa first and I'll go to in West Africa first and I'll go to um, the telecoms um, tie-in. Um, the challenge for the West African market is a bit uh, Different. The, the first thing you have to remember is Nigeria accounts for uh, almost about 75, if not as high as 80 percent of the entire West African market. So outside of Nigeria, um, that in terms of GDP now, outside of Nigeria, there is um, there isn't that much um, within the rest of the West African sub-region. Uh, there are potentials within certain markets such as Ghana. Um, Ivory Coast, um, but again, the other challenge uh, West Africa has is West Africa has the Anglo-Francophone uh, uh, split, yes. which East Africa, um, you know, doesn't have that problem. So you find a situation where with um, with a, a Francophone uh, banking license, for example, you can operate in quite a number of other. Uh, uh, Francophone West African countries. Uh, you can't do likewise with um, coming from an Anglophone country. So the dynamics are a bit different, but the single uh, major thing to point out is the fact that the size of the rest of the West African market, yeah. you know, really um, does not pre uh, present as uh, interesting an opportunity as what you have within East Africa where uh, the uh, divergence is not as much. If I go back to the issue on uh, telecoms, the challenge goes around that regulatory framework again. So within banking, for example, um, there is a regulatory framework for mobile um, money operators. Uh, same does not exist within insurance. Yes, we're trying to tap into um, some of these areas, but a lack of direct um, regulation around what is bank assurance, uh, what, you know, the institutions being regulated by CBN, how well can insurance and other financial, non-banking financial um, sector operators uh, leverage on these same assets. A lot of these areas, there are um, no clear regulation. So no sooner do you make investments within a particular area, um, they're conflicting um, regulation, regulatory interpretations mm. of existing regulations that uh, require you to either scale back or shut down some of those operations. So there's a lot that can be that needs to be done in terms of clarifying that space. Mm -hmm. When that is done, I believe the opportunities, as we've seen with the advent of um, micro insurance within the t while partnering with telecom operators. The interest from the consuming market has been quite impressive. Mm. Uh, what we've seen so far has been our expectation. So it's just around um, fine tuning the regulation around this space and creating that enabling environment for operators mm. to really uh, push the tape. Yomi, I think that's a really interesting point on the front of microinsurance. Let's bring it back to Johannesburg. Microinsurance has been positioned as the panacea for financial inclusion in Africa. Is it living up to that promise, Lange? 
I think in some of the other countries like Kenya, it, it probably is. In South Africa, I don't know how uh, far I can say it has gone to contributing to solving our financial inclusion problem. I think um, that's one of the areas that creates a, a potential for someone who's looking to penetrate um, the South African market. I think um, particularly if you look at the dynamics of how our economy is structured, uh, the, the, the proof that such a model would work is in the existence of stock fails and mm. the funeral policies and the burial societies and so forth. So it really gives testament to that micro insurance could work in South Africa, but you need to obviously be very innovative in how you're delivering because once you leave the urban areas in South Africa, you mm. start to face the same distribution uh, challenges and you need to be very innovative in how you're getting your product mm. to the people and your payments from the people. I, I want to go back and stay with microinsurance. Yomi, let's come back to you. We're talking here about a, a, a segment that has, this is a low income group. They're difficult to reach. They're oftentimes in the rural areas. What makes it such an exciting space though for potential investors, especially when you describe the Nigerian market as one that has uh, traditional difficulty in terms of distribution channels to get insurance uh, to, to, to the ordinary consumer, it surely it must be more difficult to uh, get it to low income consumers. The, the beauty about it is that the telecom industry has done it. They've gotten to the consumers. Um, we have well over 100 million telephone lines in Nigeria today. Uh, Teledensity is about the, one of the highest rates in the world. So it's not as though um, the, the individuals we're talking about have not been reached by some uh, industry or the other, especially from a retail space. Mm. Um, so it's about channeling on that particular um, uh, sector, focusing on that particular sector to provide other services. And the good thing is the telecom operators are beginning to um, suffer in terms of um, lack of uh, desired revenues yeah. within the voice um, space. So from their perspective, they need to be able to do more with their own infrastructure in terms of revenues. And the interesting thing is, like I mentioned earlier, the the interest that we've seen within that market space, within insurance, um, has been quite encouraging. There are a couple of risks that they normally have to contend with, um, which primarily has to do with the areas around healthcare, areas around um, the injury or demise to primary breadwinners. Remember that these are um, households where uh, they have very little savings, yes. uh, their ability to get up each day and go out to work is fundamental and if they're not able to do that, if they then have recourse to um, something that pays them some level of benefit no matter how small, it keeps the family going for the next day till the breadwinner is able to get up and go out again. Um, and this was clearly depicted in uh, reports done by Elfina in terms of financial inclusion, showing the major risk exposures to um, the low-income families and the coping mechanisms that they're able to use. Yeah. Yes, they've been able to use things like the social network infrastructure, uh, extended family over time, but th the dependence on this area is gradually shrinking, meaning uh, there is and there's no other social network, no right. social infrastructure, social benefits to fall back on. Yomi, the next best thing to look at really is insurance. Is insurance. Yomi, let's come back uh, to Johannesburg. Two issues. So we've looked at the low income market. Let's talk about the middle class, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. What kind of new opportunities does this present? In particular, let's talk about retail insurance. We, we often hearing of big uh, South African players setting up retail structures in the rest of the continent. Has this spurred a, a new growth and a new investment opportunity in the space? Um, of course, with the growing middle class, people have a greater disposable income. They're exposed to a whole lot more in terms of opportunities. And that in of itself presents a greater um, opportunity as well for the insurance space because now, like Yomi was saying, um, 
there's an opportunity within the space of health insurance. There's an opportunity also in household and uh, vehicle insurance. Um, as the middle class begins to grow and to expand in South Africa as well, and more um, of the black population migrates to what is termed middle class, definitely there's going to be a huge opportunity for people who are in the insurance space. And the same dynamic applies within the rest of the continent. And I think um, insurance companies need to be positioning themselves right now to say, okay, um, as, they, as this growth in the middle class happens, what are the new social dynamics that are emerging and how do we create products and programs that meet that sense? Mm. And I think uh, one of the companies for me that has done well in that space is Discovery. They've latched on to the fact that we are more health conscious and therefore they've started to craft their programs around rewarding us as a consumer market and as a growing middle class for becoming more health conscious. It certainly sounds that uh, there is definitely a low level of insurance penetration on the continent, but in the same breath, there is vast opportunities for investment. We've looked at West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa, and the picture is the same. The continent is open for business, and the insurance sector is one way to make your money from it. That's all we have time for tonight. Thank you so much to my guest. That's Langa Madongo. He's an analyst. And African Strategic Impact Advisors and Yomi Onefade, Retail Divisional Director at Mansard Insurance. Do remember to send us your comments. The details are on your screen. We do love hearing from you. From myself and the Invest Africa team, it's goodbye.